Hello, music lovers. It's Greg Bendian here in the broadcast, and very happy to be speaking with a super talented musician today that that I've been a great admirer of for many years. Ryan Olcott is here, and uh, Ryan is known to many a music aficionado as the guy from Twelve Rods. He's the singer, guitarist songwriter, producer, lyricist. And uh, we're going to talk all about that and, and some of the classic 12 Rod stuff. I don't know if, uh, if everyone here has heard of 12 Rods, but you, you may have seen in, in the series, we've had a group called Crack the Sky. And I kind of think of uh, 12 Rods as being a mighty independent American band in, in the, the mode of Crack the Sky. And those guys were doing that back in the 70s their own thing, not the same thing every song, mixing it up, bringing it together in a lot of different ways. And certainly that's the case with my guest today. 12 Rods existed from 1992 to 2004. Their music could be described as a blend of heavier stuff with psychedelic, pop, some proggy things, a definite beautiful melodic bent ballads, uh, even sort of dream pop areas, I think, in, in some of the stuff, if that's fair. Uh, but they are one of the most original U.S. bands, uh, super unique, harmonically adventurous. These are the things that I admire in, in, in really cool mobile units, as Mr. Fripp would say, but really interesting band all the way around. I'm a big admirer of their sound, and uh, I'm so happy to have Ryan Alcott. Hi, Ryan. Hey, hello. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Yeah, really, really happy to have you. Um, been listening to this stuff for, for probably 20 years. And uh, because I think I heard Separation Anxieties first. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I heard older stuff. And then I heard the final album, Lost Time. So that for what that's worth, that was, yeah. you know, how I heard things. So I kind of was really happy to hear Lost Time last because I, I do view that as uh, as the pinnacle for you guys and just such an incredible outpouring of, of beautiful songwriting, great performances, great sound. You know, uh, the production is just utterly happening for what I would, would think a rock band should sound like in the studio. And, it, and it, we'll talk about that. I have a lot of questions. You know, I like to geek out on this stuff and how stuff went down. But uh, Ryan, tell me a little bit about your musical beginnings. I'm so curious where, where this all ends up coming from. Uh, well, yeah, the obligatory of the musical parents, you know. Oh, really? Parents were, yeah, they're a, my dad is a jazz professor at university, university level, tenured, now retired um, oh, professor of music. Uh, Miami University. Um, in Oxford, Ohio. Miami, Ohio. Yeah, that was, my dad ran the jazz department there and he was a trumpet professor. Um, he's he, an academic musician, in other words. Um, he read a lot, written a lot of books and so forth. And, and you know, in that scene, he's, you know, he's doing pretty good. Um, anyway, uh, my mother was, a, was a, a pianist who, who was professional as well. And, uh, you know, it just comes with that. You know, you wake up every morning. I woke up literally every morning to the sound of my dad practicing, you know, scales, etudes, arpeggios over and over every morning of my life. So it's just like, you know, the constant cycles of, of uh, modes and scales and out of my brain, you know, since I can remember. So it's, that starts probably there. <laughs> but, you know, my dad is a very enthusiastic musician too. Very, he's a great showman and so mm. forth. So he, he definitely fueled the fire of the love of music in general. It was like, without it being, you know, a forced issue we knew my brother and i were music i mean we're just born to a musical family it's just strong you know why not just become musicians at the highest degree that we possibly know how to that's really what it boils down to and it's it's just been a and then i hit punk rock phase where it just you know all of a sudden you take a hard left and you get into you know more abstract stuff you know when i was about 11 or so and i was into skateboarding heavily and you know of course i get into punk rock and my my dad and i are at odds with like how we view music but Prior to that, you know, studying jazz and all this stuff. And, you know, so there's that part where my dad just not very approval, approving of my music, you know, the era, you know, why has it got to be so loud? 
you know, <laughs> needless to say, I mean, while my dad is sitting in front of his trumpet ensembles of 24 trumpets blasting him in the face, you know, so it's like, dad, you're, never mind. It's a different, different era. Didn't really get it. But I think over time, I think I, I've, I've gained approval and it's, I got to admit, there's a whole other side story, but you know, there's always been a, I guess, a seed of like a, you know, I, 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 I always sought for my father's approval, you know, in some way. he was always very, he encouraged everything I've ever done, but at the same time, you know, kind of shook his head at the whole, you know, rock, you know, exit I took, um, but. So what's his so era? It was, what, was then, that? then what is his era of music that he loved? Uh, he's up bebop, swing, um, but when things get into bop and avant and, you know, when Coltrane goes, you know, semi-tonal, it's just like, nope, done, done with it. Nothing. You know, my dad does not understand or doesn't get into the avant movements of, Fair uh, of jazz. Fair yeah, enough. I mean, academics, you know, it's uh, whatever. That being said, you know, but my dad recognizes me as a songwriter now and I've had him on a lot of my records and he's, you know, I've gained his approval, even though my stuff sounds completely, I suppose, just um, uh, not very conventional. Um, but I say this, Ryan, the trumpet and the melodic thing that you have, that he had, that's interesting because your range is similar to the trumpet range. Yeah, you know, you got a point. I never really thought about that. And I really um, think that be... you, the way that you move melodies around, mm -hmm. and I say this to, to the people who have not heard 12 Rods, Check this guy out because the way that you hang out over a sus chord and get things to happen inside those little melodic turns, mm -hmm. I love that kind of vocalizing. Thank you. And so, so that I, I would just, you know, my two cents in there that I, because I, my dad was also a huge influence on me musically, but he was just a tremendous music lover. Yeah. So we had everything in the house and it was, right. you know, that. The so, strange thing about, yeah, my, my father never, we never played music, like other people's music in the house. I mean, we had a whole bunch of records, we had racks and racks of records, but I don't recall my dad ever whipping out a record in front of me and playing it, which is really strange. It would always be live music. It'd always be talking about music or real time music. We all had a bunch of records. I had a bunch of records, but we'd never share them together with the family. It was a really kind of strange dynamic looking back at it, you know, um, it, it, and I never really understood that one because I look at my dad's records and they're really phenomenal. And, you know, it, it gets into some weirder stuff too. It gets into oh some God. psychedelic movements at times. And it's I'm like, wow, dad, they're really cool. He never talks about them, never brings them up. He just wants to get rid of all of his records. I'm like, I don't get this. So there's that strange sort of like, how much do we share with each other? How much do we really need to connect? Because I felt there was a lot of open questions in our musical relationship because my dad never forced or had me listen to records with him. It was more so listen to him play, which I never had a problem with, but it was, I don't know if he knew right away that we just wouldn't have, or he thought that my might have not been in, into his music. Maybe so as self-conscious about it as I might've been. I don't know. It, it's, 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 there's weird little holes and gaps in my family dynamics that are peculiar. Um, things like that, and, you know, that, that kind of add up to, you know, you know, the culmination of what I've turned into, but I think overall, um, in the end result, I think I got I got the utmost support from my from my father, <laughs> and he likes what I do, even though I'm not like you know, I don't have a great career out of it. He he's really happy that I'm like pursuing this, uh, you know, at my at the degree that I am, and I think he's heard a couple of songs that he he genuinely likes. <laughs> he likes the melodicism of certain things or the changes or how he could likes he, how could he not love like rock and roll band or your secret safe with me? I, and yeah, I, I would yeah I would agree. It might have right. been around that time when my dad's like, hey, maybe my son can actually write songs. Because I remember the first time telling him in a car ride going from like, we're just driving at night from Cincinnati back to Oxford. And I told him point blank, I'm like, I think I want to be a songwriter. And this is pretty young, pretty young. And um, he's like, what? <laughs> I came out of nowhere. I'm like, and he starts explaining to me like what a song means academically and this and, you know, and, you know, I'm listening really hard, you know, so my dad always thought I was going to be maybe some amateur songwriter because of, of whatever reason. I'm just a kid to say, oh, I'm going to write songs. He's like, oh yeah, whatever kid. But then he actually saw me develop it. And all of a sudden he's like, okay, I actually like this song. And it was really, I mean, that's honestly, um, I don't know. That's, that's where that stands. I know I've just repeated that again, but it's, it's one of those strange um, 
it really it meant a lot to me. It meant very much to me because all my life, deep in the back of my mind, I was trying to escape my dad, but also impress my dad at the same time. Sure. sure. So it's because he's, you know, a highly acclaimed musician in this field. He knows what's up, you know, and I respect everything he's had to say. He taught me how to swing. He taught me a lot about all sorts of bass lines. He taught me how to write, taught me about theory, taught me all sorts of stuff. So it's, you know, and I never for once regretted that or, uh, you know, took that for granted. So, um, but yeah, he was at odds with my punk rock, <laughs> but, you know, it was what it was and, and my skateboarding, but, you know, it was one of those years there are things he's had to do but anymore it's like my dad and I are very much close to being best friends you know we he lives in Minneapolis now after he retired and he has a studio now too and I'm teaching him stuff now the same stuff that he taught me because he taught me how to use like early computer programs because he was delegated the responsibility to be the guy in the late 80s to teach MIDI software at the university so we had to bring it all home the first computers and we'd learn it all together and it was fascinating. Um, and now it's like, you know, he's in his mid, late seventies now, and he's kind of forgets a few things, but he's still as like fiery as he ever was. So I just go to his place and show him what he taught me 30, 20 years ago. And it's wild. Things go full circle, but it's, um, he constantly writes on the computer, just like I do to this day. So I definitely get some fire from him. Um, he's, it's amazing. He's just a sponge of information still. So he's a pretty unique bird. Um, so yeah, my, my influences are strong, strongly revolve around, you know, that and, and, and not directly musically. It's just, uh, uh I guess the, the, the morals and the ethics involved with, with music, you know, we're pretty high standards in general, you know, always, you know, stuff like that. It was pretty, you know, my, my brother was a much better musician than I was too. So I feel like I was always having to fill his much larger shoes and, a lot of pseudo competition and a lot of anxiety and panic attacks <laughs> of the same time, but nothing I wouldn't change for the world, you know? Um, uh, it was just a, you know, but there was music all the time everywhere. So it was interesting to be able to like come to, come to the realization that I'm born into this academic music, but at the same time, you know, in the mid early eighties, I'm like looking at MTV as a kid going, there's this whole world of music, you know, I'm like, I'm looking at my, you know, the, the world I know, then I look at, um, you know, for example, MTV or look at some awesome zines or magazines going, what is going on? How am I missing out on this part of the music world? And I'm like, local music is the jam. I'm so into it. You know, when I'm really young. I'm trying to, you know, busting into shows underage and, you know, it's, I don't know, that, that was a whole other breakthrough of world that I, I don't even think my dad understands the whole realization and the, becoming of uh, local music scene and stuff like that. That's Well, that's you know. super important right there because that's this concept that I like to talk about, which is what is the music of my time? What is the music of my moment? Mm -hmm. And it's not your dad's music. Typically not, right? Well, it wasn't. Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, and even the, the aesthetics of, of it all were, were way changing. I mean, compared to my, my dad's academic world to the punk rock that was really exciting me at the time and it's the polar ends of the spectrum like what um, bands for me personally um well back in the day i guess i was i was really into who's do i was really into Susie and the banshees i was really into dead kennedys i was really into dead milkman as a kid um uh any band that had the word dead in it was great um <laughs> dead boys dead moon you know i don't know just <laughs> just uh Oh God! Just I have tapes about and like Minutemen though. Oh yeah, Minutemen was actually the very first record I bought with my own money. It was uh, Buzz so O'Hara. I, I hear some Minutemen in really? some of the Twelve oh, Rocks. I'm a big D Boone fan. A big D Boone. I'm also a big Firehose fan. Yeah. Um, and from Ohio, you know, he's a great songwriter too. I yeah. mean, Mike Watts, awesome. You know, it's I, yeah. I, 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 I got a chance to see. I didn't get a chance to see Minutemen, but, but I do have the record. That was my first punk rock record I bought. Was Buzz O'Hara under the influence of Heat. It was an amazing record. Um, um, but yeah, and I have, I have all the fire hose, but I, I'm flattered that you say that. I mean, honestly, that there was, what song was it? Especially like a, I felt like a gringo. Remember that song? Yeah. It was on yeah. that record. That was a huge influence on my writing at the, of the day. I, wouldn't, I wasn't even writing at that point. I just remember me and my, I said, I want to write like this. 
I think I even probably lied about it to my sister friend. Like, this is my new band. Check us out. They haven't heard of it. I'm like, ah, I'm just kidding. It's not me. But I want to be this. You know, it was a lot of that going on. Yeah, we wanted to be the Minutemen. They're one of our star groups in junior high. But I don't know. But yeah, thank you for saying that. I mean, it's a lot. I'm glad that comes through because they were a big influence, you know, so. Well, yeah, you. I mean, I, you know, I worked a lot with Nels Klein who, who did stuff with Watt and, uh, and the, the engine room. Do you know that Watt album contemplate? Yeah, the that, was, yep, yep. that was one of the later ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but at that time he was doing that. I was doing, uh, interst interstellar space, this Coltrane project with Nels. And he was doing the, the trio with Watt when they were doing this full opera wow. of his father. Again, the father, his father was in the Navy. And it's a whole contemplating of his father's death on the ship. Whoa. He doesn't die on the ship, but the figurative in the engine room of the ship. And, you know, they're from Pedro. And it's this whole mythology based upon his father's life. Mm -hmm. And... And it just came to mind that, you know, in the context of what we're talking about, of your influence, like there's Watt doing a whole big piece about his dad. It was very heavy. I bet. Yeah, I, 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 this is, yeah, I haven't heard, I guess I haven't heard that record. I guess I need to. I, there was, was that after Flying the Flannel? I think so, yeah. And, and it's with Nels, and I can't remember the name of the drummer. But it's a fantastic Watt trio. Okay, record. I need to check that one out. I guess I kind of just lost touch with some of those. Yeah, no, I know this just happened because that during that time we were working together. But um, yeah, so you know, I, I kind of hear the you know, I always like to know what the influences are, and then it makes a lot of sense. Can I? Did you ever listen to XTC? Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean that's one of the first comparisons people like to make. Um, XTC. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Oh yeah, I, mean, I have a few of their records for sure. And you know, between that and uh, early Beach Boys was something that V2 was constantly sending me records of. And I had a couple already, but they constantly love to make those two reference or, or uh, uh, comparisons with XTC oh, right? and like a certain, certain yeah. Was, and they they kind of wanted me to be in a certain way, like oh next the next XTC, you know, to a certain degree, whatever panned out. And I thought that was cool. That was probably the coolest thing I, any label could have tried to do because I loved XTC. I'm a huge fan, but. Um, Yes. So Any yes. Stuff in particular? Uh, yes. What what XTC stuff? Uh, um, I, I mean, I guess my first real love of song, like probably majors and generals, was probably like you know this that song I heard as a kid. I just I love the way the chorus just kicked in, mm -hmm. broke down but changed. It's beautiful, you know, major to with the second chord, a minor chord. It was just it was a lot of cool major minor. Uh, 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 uh well in the relative major minor sort of, you know, mm -hmm. things that he would do. He was just really good at chords. I mean, I just, I really, and I don't know. And he had that kind of punk sensibility where he was just, just he was just kind of crazy at the same time. So I just, well, like, something do you about know XTC, complicated just, game. What's that? Complicated game. Do you know that one? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. It's, just, uh, on, it's on drums and wires. Okay. Um, it's I guess, you know, pretty, I did it's pretty punky. Yeah. Yeah. I need to, I guess I didn't review that one. I, uh, but yeah, you know, um, really, really interesting chord movement, you know, so I can see that. And, and, you know, Ryan, this is the question that I always have, which is, is there not a place in rock for some sophistication? Um, there isn't a place. <laughs> I mean, there is a place, but it's deep underground. I think it exists in our cultures of, you know, our, you know, 2% of people that are mu avid music listeners that, yeah, people, exist like us and it's, it's sometimes hard to even well fathom anymore that they do exist but i will you know i'll be reminded now and again that i you know if there are pockets of fans that still are into what i've done and or you know are, are always asking about if anything new is coming out or and so just that alone and it's such a small percentile it probably hopefully might what even exists it's 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 nice to hear that they're as small as that subculture is, you know, I, I guess they do. I mean, people like prog music and they always will. I have, I have a few friends that are, you know, have the strangest music collections in the world. And uh, if people like that exist, we're not, we're not a majority by any stretch of the imagination. And that's, that's fine. You know, that's fine. Thank you for the better. Um, but as far as like how it is, if an industry is involved with that at all, I don't think so. <laughs> I think right now it's that, that's, that's the problem. There's no real outlet other than like playing, you know, obscure live shows and really releasing, you know, 
more or less on records that might not see the light of day. I mean, uh, on a major, on a larger scale, I think it just boils down to that. We're just, we're just pushed back deep into the underground. I mean, <laughs> and, and that's, that's cool. Honestly, I don't mind that at all. I don't think the state of the mute state of the industry is that cool anyway. <laughs> so I don't really want to even be a part of it. You know, I'd much rather just kind of do my own thing. And if anyone decides to pay attention, it's just, you know, that's good enough. I think honestly, that's just, I don't, with what I've been through, it's just, it was just kind of a let down to me enough to be like, you know what? They don't really get the reason why I'm doing this as much as they say, Oh, we're this longevity and we'll bring this to win it. We're, we're going to really nurture your, your career. I'm like, oh, great. That's awesome to hear. You know, a month later, you're dropped and they don't say anything about anything. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's just fueled with lies and deception. So it's, yeah, the, that I'm getting that out of the picture. It's just a different, you know, I, I can kind of clear my head, but also, I also have a huge chip on my shoulder now, unfortunately, about some, that's certain things that I now have developed into anxieties and fears over, over the industry and, or lack thereof, and, or, you know, my little, flash in the pan little involvement with them it was it's and hardly it feels almost like a dream anymore it's just like i caught the last tail end of a wave in music that in the 90s that was probably da going downhill anyway we just got the last little you know you know it's interesting you say that because you're part of a wave that that includes things like uh sound garden contemporaneously right mm -hmm. they're they're starting to pick up um, Jane's addiction, it's worth <laughs> noting around the same time period. Uh -huh. And I, I view you guys as, as contemporaneous with that because you were, and uh -huh. also musically, it's sort of a bunch of bands trying to do a kind of sophisticated rock where it's very, very melodic vocals are strong. And, and what's wrong with that? Nothing, right? Some, some guys get, you know, top 10 radio play, whatever. But, but all those bands to me were like the last gasp of very creative, sort of anything can go type rock bands, which were the, the spirit of rock that I loved. Me too. And I think there was a window and an opportunity for that to happen in the 90s, strangely enough, before everything crashed. It was wild. I mean, I remember seeing like, you know, when, you know, the beginning of the 90s late 80s when punk was starting to break again i'm like all of a sudden all these really strange bands are like making it and i'm like i can do this i can feel it deep down that I, I i can do weird music too and i have a lot of it in me already and it was a very interesting window of time um because anymore even think about that it just seems so so far-fetched um because everything is so streamlined and programmed and uh uh, uh you know, homogenized to this incredible degree anymore. It's a, uh, um, and for whatever it's worth, you know, it's just, I'm not knocking on any artists or that are successful today. It's just, you know. Well, tastes just, of an audience can change. I always also like to say that the further we get away from people having been exposed to music education in the schools, mm -hmm. the harder it will be to bring musical sophistication to that a, is very vast, true. a large audience. And yeah, how many and years are we away from that since Reagan, right? God, no, no, I was, yeah, he pretty much destroyed. Yeah, that, that was the beginning of the end of uh, the uh, for because educational. We were, we were given culture in it, you were given it in the home, we were, and and probably at school, and we had it at school. So we came up with this culture of well, everybody has a piano, everybody yeah. knows, plays piano, everybody takes piano lessons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah, I, I, even all my friends' moms were piano teachers. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was that ingrained in, in, in just your domestic everyday life, you know, it really was. And uh, well, now everything with, 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 you know, the advent of computers and this and that, that whole playing field is way changed. You know, it's like, you know, everyone just reverts to their Spotify for anything musical anymore. It has nothing to do with any, a musical instrument, Harley. And, you know, I think, do you have Ableton and do you have a, a computer, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, let's make a trap beat or let's, you know, third, it, it, it's really... There's so many presets to, and I, I, I that's the education, but even the culture. I mean, I feel like not only is my, my household upbringing was very important, but I just think what was on the radio. I also come from Oxford, Ohio, which had the, which was the city or the town that had the first modern rock. It's 97X, which was like the, the model college rock radio station. I grew up with that. Didn't realize it until I moved out of town. Like, wait, I grew up with that. No other city had that privilege to kind of like get a, here's a, you know, uh, 
here's a precursor of what's to come in the 90s. And we're here like five years in advance, like REM, in like 1985 and 1986 on the radio, you know, and Trip Shakespeare and, you know, all these things that like, no one will hear for another 10 years. And, you know, and I'm taking it for granted, but a little, you know, then I get to the 90s and I'm like thinking, man, we have a cool station for such a small town. Mm. And they moved to Cincinnati and then they fold. But that was a huge thing. I mean, the opportunity to be able to hear such a great radio station you know, at such a young age, and you know, that has a lot to do with it. It was just a like a very strange, beautiful time in culture, I guess. You know that I I, I'm, I feel lucky enough to at least you know graze up against. Um, so that that's a huge thing, man. I talk about it all the time. Coming up in a pretty decent area in New Jersey that had people from across New York City teaching in in the schools from you know from that went to Juilliard mm -hmm. that were you know my band director went to Juilliard he yeah was, you know he was a, he was a student of Vincent Persichetti well so you know that was just by happenstance of growing up in Teaneck New Jersey yeah but it you know meant the world because I had a college education by the time I was out of high school musically yep. speaking because of the these guys were and that and the percussionist from the New Jersey percussion ensemble was the high school percussion teacher that's amazing. crazy so so Man. that you know I I know what you're saying and I don't I don't take it for granted I do really appreciate that that happened shout out to Joseph Lavelli and shout out to Gary Van Dyke and you know because that's that was they saw you were serious and they gave it back to you yeah thank you I mean it's, uh, I don't know There's a lot of thoughts going through my head right now it's uh but let me ask you this, Ryan. Rods, right? Let me ask you about how does Twelve Rods come together? Because you and Ev had been playing music together since what? Well, I guess that that, that I mean, there's always okay. He he grew up as a saxophone prodigy at a very early age. Ev, my brother did, and so we never really played music together up until we realized, you know when college music and stuff was starting to get cool again, that we both coincidentally liked the same music. We both liked Jane's Addiction. We both liked, at the time, like a Red Hot Chili Peppers. And we didn't even know that we both liked these groups. And we're like, whoa, we can actually get along again, you know? Cause there was a, you know, sibling rivalry to a certain degree. But then we realized, oh, you know, I'm starting to introduce him to a few groups and, and my buddy Valentine, and he's introducing me to some other stuff. I'm like, wow, we're friends again. And then had to have, wait until like out after we both graduated high school almost until these things kind of happened. And so at that point, we're have heavily interested in playing music with each other. And even though the first incarnation of Rod didn't involve him in the band, I mean, he as soon as we could, we wanted him in the band. Um, it was just And he was a multi-instrumentalist early on? Yeah, uh, he, we both were taught Suzuki violin, um, probably starting age three. Um, did the Suzuki thing for a couple books. Um, he went on to play saxophone. I became a percussionist. Um, and, you know, thanks, you know, he's, he's four, four and a half years ahead of me. So, you know, he's, you can't, when you're growing up, it's, it's, it's that's a huge distance when you're young, you know, it's, it's almost a, an era. And so it's, so, it's, so he was in college when you were in high school. Right. Yeah. I just, yeah. My freshman, yeah. Four years essentially. So. And it's a good, it's cool. I don't know how I would have been able to handle going to school with my brother, um, <laughs> which was interesting. I never really went to school with him, even though we went to school, same school system. We were always in different schools. So, but you guys were always doing separation. Like he always had a life and I never knew and I vice versa. So, so you guys were doing everything in school bands and outside of school as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. We were, I mean, we were doing, um, well, not, of course, all the school or, you know, bands, orchestras, jazz bands and marching bands blah 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 but, yeah we also did our extracurricular honors stuff you know omea this ohio ohio music academic you know anything involving that or honors orchestras you know uh, band camps orchestral camps you know summer we, camps it was uh, summer camps all the time my dad would go to blue lake fine arts camp every year in michigan my dad would teach there for four six weeks and we'd just stay there and be faculty brats and hang out in this forest where it's just music all the time and it was very surreal and that was like 12 years in a row and that was my entire summer 12 years in a row so it's it's just music 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 and whether or not 
I related to it. Like, this is exactly what I want to do. It didn't matter. It was just like constant melody, harmony, and, you know, rhythm everywhere all the time, you know. But it never really came from records. It was always from live sources. You know, I was always thrown into a situation where I'd go to my dad teaching. I'd walk into a room and there's my dad like conducting a a band or a jazz band or trumpet ensembles. And I'm just, just what what you listen to anymore. So you don't even think about like, oh, that's our version of listening to records, I guess. It's just this live interaction all the time. But we never really, as a family, played music together. We're always too removed, you know. There was a certain caliber that my dad was, a certain caliber my brother was, a certain caliber I was that it was a respectful place to be, but we never jammed, you know? It was a very strange professional, you know? You just you let them do their thing and, you know, you don't want to have too much fun with it almost. <laughs> wow. It became very, very academic, even as an upbringing thing. And it, so punk was busting out of that. Yeah, oh my God, it was it was incredibly liberating. You know, it was just, it was, everything about it, you know, um, between that and skateboarding, it was just what I needed as a kid. And it just opened my world up to the concept of community, you know, local, you know, uh, local music, um, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, in 89, 90, I was just like, you know, opening my eyes, skating around town, seeing all these band posters from the college going, these look amazing. And just, I not, didn't even know what they really, really were. And I was just stealing them because they looked great. And I had probably like at least two walls plastered with band posters um from the university bands that i didn't know who they were but i just was in love with the concept of seeing this crazy artwork of whoever it was a a name that made no sense to me and this strange colored poster and then you know i start realizing they start really i could sneak into these shows somehow and get a glimpse of that and it was just you know life-changing and it's a totally different musical uh well experience uh, than anything I was ever ever learned before, and that within itself was like, how could there be all this with the wealth of stuff I feel like I've already learned? You know, there's still this whole other wide world of of creative and uh, uh, I guess independent music that not that I was trying to, to be sheltered from at all. It just it just my parents were never involved with it. They never encouraged that side of it at all. It was just everything was getting a band practice on time or make sure you practice four hours a night. And that's it. <laughs> but the idea of going to see bands and actually enjoying yourself and getting into you know styles and it's op- mind expansion stuff was just you know not where my parents come from. And my dad was not a hippie. My dad lived in Hayden Ashbury, literally Hayden Ashbury in '69. He was a beatnik and he didn't like hippies, but he played trumpet all the time. You know, it was you know in the coffee houses. He was not so he has a strong aversion to hippie psychedelic stuff. And he anytime he can he'll that he sees some sort of psychedelic movement or something that I reference to in my art, he will definitely make some almost condescending remark about how he hates hippies. <laughs> so it's, you know, I had to be up against that too. So, and they which made me want to be a hippie at the time, be a hippie even more or, or, or be even more counterculture. So there was that. So I try to get respecting all of which my dad taught me, try to take that whole academic life and try and acclimate it to anything punk rock was, I wouldn't want to say hard, but it was this a very unique situation for me to kind of divide my brain. Like, okay, I'm going to listen to all these cool tapes I have for four hours. Then I got to go downstairs and practice four mallet marimba stuff for the next four hours. Completely different. It's like, you know, it's, and then I, it was a complete separation. And it didn't even occur to me that it was like my, my brain was divided like that musically for many, many years. What was, your realized, profession, wow, what was the different profession types. department like at the school? It was mediocre. Um, uh, Dr. Alban, um, William Alban, he was a uh, he, he graduated from uh, one of those really cool Indiana universities. Uh, had a great percussion program. He's he, he's a good percussionist. Uh, I've had some pretty great good teachers. Um, the percussion had a big actually a really lot of lot of facility there. Um, I would, and luckily I had access to it, uh, which was great. <laughs> but and my teacher was good. I had a few different teachers at the university. Um, but that was taking university courses and, and which getting, university this is, this is Miami university still where my dad taught and it's uh, a good program though. Yeah, it, it was actually, it was great. It was actually for what it was. It brought in a lot of, my dad was really good at recruiting uh, uh, students all over the world. My dad was had jazz festivals there that would bring in uh, high school students from all over Ohio to 
not only they can showcase their high school jazz bands, but you know, it was a big recruiting technique. And my dad slayed and they loved him there for that. Wow. So um, it was, That's a I was starting era. to see that it was all business too after a while. And it was just, you know, uh, I had a point to this. I, I'm sorry, I went on a tangent there. I'm trying to think where, I went, where I'm supposed to be going with this conversation. Well, um, you know, I wondered also what your harmonic thing comes from because it's so adept and so so facile and so melodic and in, in, in everything even the hardest stuff you guys do i always feel like your voice has has an interesting melodic thing going on when it's needed what yeah. were what were some of those harmonic things that really kind of spun your head a bit when you were coming up that made you want to write that music that's so rich hmm. i mean there's so oh god uh, I mean, there is a, uh, I remember the first song I cried to, and I must've been like one or two. And I remember it was, it was like a Carpenter song. And I remember just hearing it as a, I, I was in my crib still. And there was this movement in there that just made me start weeping. Um, and it was a chord change. I couldn't really understand what they were saying even, but I remember there were some chords that just affected me so deeply. Um, and was it close to you or uh, we've only just begun? It was, well, it was, it was, uh, uh, was it rainy days and Sundays? Rainy days and Monday. Well, uh, 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 it was that one or uh, it could have been, um, oh God, I think it was rainy days and Sundays. And I think about the song in my head, I'm like, what was the great movement that really made me? And I'm like, there's some cool stuff in there but i don't know that song that that was the song that made me like really like weep for the first time but i don't know i just i i, I can't other than say that you know the obligatory like my yeah the academic upbringing helped me refine my the harmonic and the, my counterpoint and this and that but there are i always loved hearing good modulation in a song like all of a sudden the chorus comes in and without being like cheesy whoa, everything goes down like a major third, you know, and there was something like that. I'm like, yeah, it was cool. But some constant heart, you know, uh, melodies, you know, just ties it all together. And I'm just, I, 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 I was always a sucker for that, uh, for the modulations. And it, was, it wasn't because it was geeky. It just felt amazing, you know. And I never really was into, like, a lot of strong, like, odd time signatures or just freaky chords for the sake of freaky chords, you know. Every note kind of always mattered and you know, if I'm going to write a chord, it's just the next chord is just going to have to be the next most natural chord to play. You know, it's just that was the philosophy of everything I've ever written. How I, I mean, even though there has been those random songs that you hear that were just like way more advanced than they should have been, you know, in the 80s or 90s, that were just like, well, you know, a scritty politi track or a, or something like that, or just like, oh my God, that's advanced, but that's cool. Um, you know, stuff like that. It was just like, I would hone in on that. And my brother and I would geek out and go, hey, did you hear this, you know? Perfect way song that screen play, it's amazing. What's going on? You know, and we'd have those moments. We would just hear it. And it was probably because whether knowing or not, we just had refined ears. We'd hear like way more detail than we were supposed to for a kid at that time. But that just turned into my appreciation for like because of the punk rock also opened up my the pretentious, like, you know what? There is a definite line of doing way too much bullshit when you don't need it. And music, you know, punk rock taught me that, you know, aesthetic of you know, minimalism, you know, and just all sorts of stuff that revolves around those scenes um so putting those two together you know i always wanted to make the most simple most complicated song ever you know i suppose something like how could i almost contradict you know a, you know a concept of songwriting like how can i make these these strange sets of not even strange but un, i guess uh, well i always tell my students <laughs> defeat expectation yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, uh, there's, I, I, I firmly believe in the idea of just, I mean, what I do now, I mean, to get a, it, it has a lot to do with trying to make two polar contradictory sort of concepts meet, you know, trying to make the ugliest sounding crap sound sources turn into beautiful pop songs, you know, and it all kind of got really hyper evolved in that sense, post 12 Rods. 12 Rods was the beginning of me trying to figure out how to write songs. I mean, really, I just threw it all into the rock context because honestly, that was, well, it was it was cool for the day. I mean, anymore, I mean, it was, there was a point halfway through the Rods, right? I didn't want to be in a rock band. 
I, I just, it wasn't really naturally my thing, but I knew at the time it's, that rock band started, it was going to be the most possibly lucrative thing because it was the 90s. Well, what band would you have had if you didn't have Rods? Well, right now, uh, I, that, at the time, I can't answer that, but for right now, it's just, you know, I, I'm just more natural as a solo guy, only because, well, most people get fed up with me. <laughs> I think mean, most people either just abandon me because, you know, they, I just, I, I, my songwriting style, I guess, could be intimidating or something, or yeah, usually I don't have much of a problem with that, but I can see how my stuff could be a little like, you know, uh, overwhelming for like, at least for, for certain types of musicians, but it's, um, anyway, you know, post all that, I, I just wanted to be a solo guy and ultimately I've turned myself into like, you know, I, I pitch records is, is, is what I'm currently working on and it's basically lo-fi music. I don't know if, uh, what you've heard of that or, you know, the Sicastra stuff or anything else, else I've released. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the stuff, it's, it's the stuff, if anything, the stuff I hear in my head the most. I can actually get to the point where I can create that. You know, everything else was just kind of an experiment with what I can do. You've, up to the rods, even through Mystery Palace and Food Team, those are all kind of just, what can I do with what, what I've got? What was Food Team and what was Mystery Palace about musically? The absolute polar opposite of what 12 Rods was about. Um, I was, I had to figure something else out and I really wanted to, well, the idea of the well, Food Team was, I mean, stuff like I, I modify, all like drum machines and synthesizers anymore to well, for various reasons and I, i've been making music off them through mystery palace where i would just glitch noise that i would turn into pop songs um based off the worst and hardest case scenario i could find as a producer i felt like i was i had to get rid of guitars and for a while and focus on being a producer that being okay let's const constantly give myself challenges and uh uh, exercises which means okay gather crazy instruments make a bunch of really horrible sounds <laughs> or just some sort of patterns then shape that into pop shape that into the most uh, pleasing sound you can do and that was the goal of mystery palace is how i can really flex and uh, expand my, my, my my threshold of, uh, of not only tolerance but uh, uh rectification you know and, and how do i make how do i polish a freaking turd because <laughs> it was i don't know I, I i working on these machines had a lot to do with me um how do i explain this um there was something very uh gratifying about opening up machines from my youth and kind of destroying them to a certain degree but kind of making them glitch and suffer but stay alive it was a very sadistic sort of thing I had to take upon myself in music um, to go through some shit, bottom line, pardon my French, um, um, with all the post 12 rods trauma I was dealing with. And it was everything, po I mean, I, I was doing nothing for my fans. In fact, most of the fans hated the team to begin with. And that's exactly what I wanted because I was fed up with everything. I wanted to be removed from that entire scene. I wanted to do something so different and out there and that, you know, I had to redefine myself. And this is the most hardcore thing I could do musically and, and, and stand on my own two feet and say, you know what? I'm not just a 12 Raj guy. I have all this I can do and check this out. Let me just destroy an instrument for you. I'm going to make some songs out of it just to show you what possibly can be done, whether I can achieve it or not. I don't know, but I tried it. And to me, I'm very happy with my results. I've made a few records that were released on, on cool, you know, independent labels through Mystery Palace that was it's glitch noise with a dub bass line and, a, and a, a real, you know, break beady drummer and me singing like airy vocals on top of it. And it was an impossible combination that we made work. I mean, you hear the stuff and it doesn't sound like anything you've ever probably heard. I don't know if you have heard it, but to me, it's some of my most proud stuff. Where can just, people, where can people find that stuff, Ryan? Um, it should be available on a lot of platforms. Uh, if you type in Mystery Palace, um, and my name, it, it, something will show up. It's there's also a couple labels out there, uh, either Zod or um, Magic Rub, or like Totally Gross National Product. They, they have releases of, of a few different. It, hopefully, it'll be easy to find, but I haven't looked in a while. But I can send stuff to you for, as well. Yeah, that I'd was love, a whole, like, I'd love to hear that. I've I've not uh, found that yet. 
cool. Um, I'll, I'll do that. There's that. And then that lasted for about four or five years. I quit music for another three years because that was driving me crazy. Um, constantly working on machines that spat out dissonance and atonalities constantly in my ears for hours on end was kind, kind of making me go insane. What kind of, what kind of subversions were you doing to these machines? Uh, rewirings. I'm, I'm, uh, it's called like circuit bending. It's modifying. I'm, I'm open up, open them up, looking at the ICs, uh, the chips, the tone, the tone chips, and I'm, I'm crossing points. I'm uh, uh, severing points. I'm adding capacitance, resistance, various things. Um, and then they turn. They sound like completely different machines. And it's. Uh, I have at least a hundred of them. I can show you. I have walls and walls of this stuff, and drawers and drawers of. I have installed thousands of switches on various machines of the past 10 years. And I made lots of music out of it. In fact, the whole pitch concept now, I've done that to tape machines. I modify tape machines to make a certain sound that warbles and, and, and based off the velocity or the, of, of a sound, it, it, like the motor will drag in certain ways and cause things to pitch and, and, and get a really lo-fi sounding. And it's the most beautiful sound in the world. And I, I, it's essentially what I'm doing. I'm basically making machines subtly malfunction. So they, <laughs> you have no idea the things that these things can do at that point. It's crazy. It's like anarchy. And to certain, but you, you also make it work very normally. If you shut all the switches off. It's not like permanently destroyed. But um, that was a big thing for a lot of my life, which turned into pitch records eventually, which was doing that to tape machines. And uh and the vocoder stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with Sicastra at all. What I've done with that. No. So tell us about Sicastra. Um, Sicastra is me. Okay. It's four track music, essentially. I'm me on vocoder and me making all the music that, in essence, the music is stuff I write and produce in a certain fashion that's supposed to sound like an era. And then I, once I'm done with that production, I destroy it. Um, through lots of horrible tape <laughs> malfunctions. And so it sounds like a, mach a, a song that's was, or from a tape that's been marinating on some car floor for 20 years. How do you manipulate the tape? Um, through these switches. Um, I had these switches and it's basically draining or adding power to certain components that add on, that make anomalies that for the most part, most tape aficionados would be like, no, that you, you want to get rid of that sound. I'm like, no, I want that sound. You know, that, that's what makes tape great. You know, it's, it but it's not just the shifting, it's, 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 the, shifting the pit, the shifting, the, 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 the wow, the flutters, the, you know, the tape sliding off the head, weird and crunching up and, you know, uh, the pitch, you know, variations and just that sound, you know, once you process it a few times, it's just, I've learned how to manipulate that sound. And I have probably about, I don't know, 11 C Costa records or pr productive records I produce for myself and other people that are strictly based off this sound and they're released on pitch records. But it's my, my sound has now become it just as it's stayed in a melodic harmonic territory. Everyone kind of says, oh, it still sounds like you writing, but it's very dependent on the textual qualities of tape. And the whole label is, is, is a tape label like that. So let me, let me ask you this. What tape guys were you aware of in that area well, who inspired you for that kind of stuff was it music concrete did you study the early stuff? yeah i mean a pure Sch schaefer yeah yeah absolutely um the totally I, I, but it, it's it's not it's not quite like you know just ra radio signals and, and 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 too much uh 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 incidental sound i mean a lot of these are kind of they're reprocessed into a pop format eventually i take all this stuff and, and gather and gather a lot of sounds that I, I, I make from various, you know, situations I put myself in. But then I, from that point, I refine it like, say, I want a 12 rod song. You know? Okay, but what, just, so then what electronica or electronic music were you? Okay, okay. Well, I'm trying to think, like, what would be... Um, or were there producers? I mean, I mean, people, people, people make. I mean, I, I, I make these like very easy references, but people put me in the category of like, you know, you got the Ariel Pinks, you got the John Mouses, you got the, you know, Toro Imois of, you know, that have that really, you know, very textural sound based music processed. It's it's in that category, um, with a lot of beat, 
friendly stuff that gets me a lot of hip hop fans, but I'm not rapping at all. There's no rap. I'm singing through a vocoder that my brother made. And I, this whole Sikasa thing was essentially just made because my brother made an application that was a vocoder, an auto vocoder. Um, and he needed me, he needed a producer to use it, represent, or at least you know, demonstrate it. I was, and he threw, threw this program to me and a few other producers. And I came back with a track or two that was like, this is what I can do with it. And I was the only guy that came back with a, with a track that, you know, this is what it can sound like. And then my brother's like, oh, okay, and the, it's, this is great. They posted it and it got, got a bunch of likes. And then he's like, you know what? We're going to have a party for the release of this app. Can you play a set? And like, <laughs> all right, I guess I got to be somebody now again. So I started C Castra and that's where it starts. It was out of necessity for my brother for his app. And then it got really fun. And then it allowed me to, like, to express a lot of new uh, things I've always wanted to do with getting back into four track and really not just using four track like I used to, like, you know, try to make it as clean as possible because <laughs> Uh, because back then it was all about overcoming problems anymore. Right. It's like all the problems have been solved. I have a computer in front of me that can do anything and it's boring. <laughs> I want all these challenges again. I want all that messed up sound that I used to kind of hate, but now it's, when I listen to those old tapes, it's the coolest thing about those tapes. So that's what I want. So I kind of, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that have done this before me. I've, I've taken it to an extreme to where every single record on pitch has to go through the same process. So I have to produce all the records. Um, and it's, it, it's, of course, with the artists, I have to go through like, you know, do you mind how I do this much stuff to it? And hopefully they'll be like, yeah, just go for it. I'm like, okay, hope you like it. Let's mess it up. And usually it turns out pretty good, um, but I will gladly link you some of that stuff because it's the thing that I'm focused on most right now and I'm working on other people's records. I've also been starting to make videos in the lo-fi field if you, all around me right now. And this is the fake background and all this stuff. I have a whole room full of bad video equipment <laughs> from like the eighties and nineties, which is essentially a, a spinoff of what's uh, second here. Like these things, this is like a little, you know, for cameras, right? You get a little, no, 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 no big deal. But you know, all these switches. Yeah, yeah. Stuff up pretty bad in a really, in a really cool sort of way. I do that with so, everything now. So you, you're getting them to glitch and you're getting them to, to pitch shift and do what sorts of things? For video or for audio? For the video stuff? Yeah. Well, yeah, essentially it's, it's anything I can do that's unconventional. You know, whatever it's been, I, I do a lot of tests uh, as I'm wiring inside and I just try to find the most usable musical or uh, just weird anomaly that can occur. And I'm like, oh, the way that the, the colors shift and everything, you know, you know, certain rays go through the screen. It just looks like that mess, you know, not using that through plugins, but using that through real analog sources through machines that people have forgotten about and you can get for like 20 bucks anymore. And actually, if you have a system, you can kind of create a really hack cool video system for a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> You know, and and push, you know, use those limitations to create this product as part of the aesthetic of what I've been doing with the four track stuff. So with the past COVID year, year months, you know, since you know, once the industry fell on its face, I decided to pick up video and make a video studio in my place. And uh, I've done two videos so far, and I'm just trying to apply all of my concepts to video. Uh, it's quite a challenge, but. It's, it's super fun. You know, it's just, I, I guess I, I'm just a producer of media now. Yeah, um, yeah and I'm, I'm a writer as well, but it's just, I, I have a lot of fun um, doing this for people on my label and other people that wish to, you know, work in my studio. It's bring me a lot of joy. Um, but I have a pretty strange studio here um, with a lot of, you know, unconventional instruments and tools that um, keep it exciting for me um, because, I just, I guess, I did. That's just how my brain works, you know. I just, uh, I just don't want to do anything twice. <laughs> I don't want to do anything that anyone's ever done before. And I know it sounds kind of pretentious and lame, and of course, oh, of course, nobody does. But you know, <laughs> I still believe that you know, there's still a few things that haven't been done yet, you know. So it, it, I, I agree I with you 100 percent on that. I apply so, that concept to my to my work. What yeah. what hasn't been done in this area that's still interesting. Yeah, you know, and yeah. you're still referring to to classic things in your work. 
you know, your harmonic shifts are, are things we've heard in other people's music. And, and they're just, you know, it's like people think Steely, Steely Dan's harmony is very sophisticated, and it is, but it's more sophisticated than anything that they'd heard in the pop realm. Yep, exactly. But in the jazz realm, it's just par for the course with the, with the backbeat. <laughs> you know, I understand. I know. I, I, I love Steely Dan. They're just, it's great stuff. And I know. That I was a massive influence, know. too. Donald Fagan is great. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing stuff. He's a great voice. And they're, I love his solo way. records, too. Didn't he just release something kind of really kind of recent? I could have sworn I saw something like a Donald Fagan something or other. If it was a documentary or if it was a... Did you see something like that at all? Or did I, I, just... I have to. I have to look. I, I yeah. did not know that. I thought he just kind of reemerged, which I'm. I, I saw that about a week ago. I thought. Anyway, different story. But no, I, I'm. Thank you for you know making those correlations, and of course I'm flattered. You know that you put my name up to the side of any of those greats. You know it's. Well, it's you know, you're always looking for something a little bit more because we, I was spoiled. I mean, I I grew up. The music was, as you say, the Carpenters, Chicago. Uh, you know, um, uh, Stan Kenton, I mean, that's going back a little bit, but, but that was, you know, big bands were playing festivals and, yeah. you know, it's, it's like a crazy culture when you think about the diversity, like, and we had New York radio, so we had yeah. the most progressive DJs playing, you know, whole sides of albums when they came out. It was, it was unhinged. Yeah. 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 It just, so it, that's my damage happen. too, you know, like yeah. if, once you're exposed to high level shit the other stuff doesn't do the same i know i know the I we're spoiled i know and then we get to, now we're just saying oh where is the good music anymore i'm never yeah. sure there is i just i but but I, you luckily, make it. I, you know you 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 have to make it exactly that's what i that, and essentially that's 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 my cure i i listen to a lot of my music too just because well i'm i, I got to the part where i'm happy with it i can listen to my old rod songs so luckily and you know 80 percent of them i can still listen to from beginning to end you know and that's to be able to like fulfill that or that uh, whatever my craving is in music, I can do that myself now, like you were just saying. And uh, that is my only you have to, you, you situation. Have to be, you have to be your own unit in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, you really it's do true. and make it all happen solo. And that goes back to like AACM guys in Chicago. They were, they were so mm -hmm. self-reliant, but everybody in the creative music organization there had to do a solo concert to show that they had it together oh, to yeah. do it yeah. solo contain like what's your music you know yeah. and so, so playing solo has been very important to me as a percussionist wow. i did two two albums and multiple tours of solo percussion concerts of my own stuff trying to come up with things that weren't done in percussion before yeah bowing vibraphone with suzuki bows you know, yeah, everyone, know. everyone used violin bows yeah. and bass bows and i'm saying you can't get around with those things you know so i was bowing with, with those kid bows wow. and that, you know all extended technique stuff to come up with other yeah. areas so that I, I i hear you man especially since that background of being fully immersed in music from such an early age where your brain connects with it I think about those two, three, four-year-old listening experiences too. Sometimes mm -hmm. it blows my mind. Yeah, I, I know. Remember. Yeah, no, it's a deal. You know what made me sad? You talk about songs like like the Carpenters. The other one for her was like, I would get so sad from Superstar. Oh yeah, Oof, yeah, that is a good song. Yeah, my dad. That was that was about as as pop as my parents ever got. My parents loved the Carpenters, but that was that was as rock and roll as they ever got, which is kind of funny to me um, but they would my, my parents luckily you know exposed me to that and I, Richard Carpenter is a brilliant arranger not gonna lie he oh, is yeah, um, really. so and and K Karen Carpenter an incredible drummer and singer it's just like what so, so that I mean, vocal are, arranging I hear some of that vocal arranging in 12 rods I, I would, yep, <laughs> without admitting to it, I would never admit back then that I was heavily influenced by the carpenter because that wouldn't have been cool, but yes, hell yeah, I was. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. As I could say, I was probably influenced by like other bands like Chicago too at the time. Yeah, you know, exactly. I love Chicago 17. I'm sorry, I was a kid. I think Chicago 17 was a great record for a kid. And, and nothing wrong with that. That's, <laughs> that's your damage, man. Yep. And, and yep. you claim it. And that's the thing. You go, you know, I felt those chords. Thank you, man. Thank you. No, that's, that means a ton because 
I felt like I was always putting a little too much more effort into choral writing in the rock and roll field than most people wanted to hear at times because I I get the the eye roll from somebody in the band like oh god here's right this big modulation oh god you know I get that now and again I understood like yeah you're right you know it's maybe a little heavy handed I should probably learn a good balance between you know trying to show off too much and not in various ways like I said 12 Rods is a complete believe it or not, learning experience. I've never written anything, a played guitar, and or sung or fronted a band prior to 12 Rods. It well, let me ask you this. With 12 Rods, when you guys are at your peak sort of, of, of output, talking about like maybe from split personalities in, you know, through into lost time, mm -hmm. the rock component is so strong. And yeah. I love how raw it gets. Yeah, we had, we were, I mean, uh, we had a good rock band outfit. I think with the, with the rhythm section that I always kind of put myself in, it was just very heavy on the on the percussive drum side with Chris or Dave. You know, they're both astounding, interesting, very unique drummers yeah. on their own. And uh, that's what I had to work with. I mean, I was a drummer too. You know, Christopher and I were, I was teaching Christopher some beats, literally the way he'd have to play them. And he would be like, cool. And he'd do it. And I'd have that sort of interaction with the drummer. So I was very like particular about the, the level of rhythm that had to be in what we did. Because of course, you know, tribal drumming at the time was huge. You know, you got, you know, Jane's Addiction did it. You know, every cool band had this drummer that was just like, you know, just like we did. Christopher nailed that. And yeah, at the time, like in Mexico. Mexico? Yeah. Yeah, that something like that. And it was all his Tom works. And I was, you know, it's just, it was, he was kind of the, the perfect 90s drummer <laughs> for me at least. And that's, it was exactly what we, I got lucky. Christopher was a very unique kid at the time. We, he was like two years younger than me, but we both skated and drummed, you know, and we met each other on the, the school bus. And it was kind of one of those like, you're a cool, weird kid, you know, it's like, you're a cool, weird kid. Let's, let's start a band. No, but it was, no, it, it, for being Oxford, Ohio, there was, there was some, some really interesting musicians that were kind of pouring out of that first being in the middle of a bunch of cornfields, you know, in Midwest. But um, well, the heavy rhythm thing was very unique. Yeah, let me ask you did. this. What, so what other bands were doing rhythm stuff the way you guys were trying to do it on the kit? Like, were you guys interested in that? You know that group Japan? Oh, absolutely. Japan, we love Japan, but Japan was had a more sterile approach to it with their rhythm. There was a very... Yeah, it was yeah. a lighter touch and, and a different sort of, we love Japan. Um, it was just, we weren't really going for that. We had a couple of friends bands that actually they were, we had a band that we played with all the time called Tin Drum. They were just, you know, and they wanted to be Japan. <laughs> we loved them for that. Um, That's it. Yeah. So it was, but at the same time, we. Um, oh, but one, one other question. And then Ohio. Um, Weren't there a lot of bands that were doing rhythmic stuff? Yeah, absolutely. It was the invoke thing. And especially even in Oxford, there was another band that was the cool band above us that we loved. And they were called Lizard 99. And they almost got signed to, but they were like the, the Cincinnati version of Jane's Addiction. And their drummer came from my high school. And he was, he was an amazing, he was a senior when I was a freshman. And he was just this incredible athlete and a philosopher and drummer guy named Pete uh, Riley who could out drum Stephen Perkins easily, you know, but had that same sort of just crazy, you know, and Christopher and I adored that. And for being a local band, it was just, yeah, it was the local Jane's addiction. And for like, you know, 1991, it was perfect. Do you think so, any of those bands came out of Captain Beefheart? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every one of the bands that uh, the members that I, I hung out with of uh, bands that I was into, absolutely had and or forced me to listen to trout mask replica you know at age 13 no doubt and and i eventually got to be part and uh, of course you know uh, the band is amazing um what's your favorite beef heart stuff uh i don't want to see trout mask replica but i'm going to say that for now because there are a few records like the which one do i have uh, that one and was it the Spotlight Kid or wait, was that a Spotlight Kid? Yeah. Is that what it is? Is that the name of the record? That's one, yeah. Yeah, I, I had that one. Uh, hmm. I'm running blank now. 
I like the later I, stuff too. I like Doc at the Radar Station. I, I haven't even listened to that one. Doc that's at the Radar. That's Station. on Virgin. Yeah. Wow. Wow. His, his what year final, was that one? His final two, I think, were on Virgin. Uh, Doc at the Radar Station and Ice Cream for Crow. And these are in the eighties. Yeah, early eighties, okay. and then it's early eighties. Okay. Stops. Yeah. They're great. Huh. They're both. Yeah, I, I did get that. I did check those out more. I mean, I'm a. I, I and those I, are all that kind of drumming. That's why I bring it up to bring it back. Hmm. You know, so just thinking about this idea, and I've I've brought up this this topic with Andy Partridge when he was on, about you know the drum parts and symbolless bands, bands that don't have a mm -hmm. lot of cymbal playing but patterns mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. drumming that contribute a line to the music. Absolutely, yeah. There was the drummers I've dealt with always had, yeah, I always have a melodicism, but. A, a pattern to equally treating all the drums the same, you know, no one gets less attention than anything else. And there's, everything's being tapped throughout the phrase, you know, to some degree, which kind of lends itself to a tribalism if you start getting heavier and heavier with it. Um, but that was just a thing. I was, uh, it was something that obviously, you know, that, that predates of course the nineties, but I just remember like all of a sudden there's this influx of drummers everywhere of that sort of style and, um, Oh yeah, it, 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 it dates back to you know way way you know way cooler things, of course. But when you're young, you know you just think, oh my God, Stephen Perkins is the first guy to drum like this, and you realize, well, that's not the case, even close. But it's uh, you know when it's you're Elvin young, Elvin Jones, <laughs> yeah, Elvin Jones, exactly. I mean, there's all sorts of jazz drummers that you can really just you know, cite, you know, Billy Cobham and you know who, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just like you know, other big racks of toms. I mean. So, yeah. So, and, 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 when you guys were doing like split personalities, you got you were signed to this Virgin label, right? V two. Mm -hmm. Did you produce that record yourselves? Uh, is that the first EP? Yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. Yep. Yep. That was done in our basement on a just an eight track task cam. Um, yeah, that was done by ourselves, and it was kind of funny because. They're like, we're gonna sign you. We want you to make a record that sounds exactly like that. And we're like, dude, you just gave us all this money to buy a new studio. How are we expected to do that? <laughs> so it, they, they, they essentially like, you know, our advanced money was a new studio. And they're like, hot, you know, then they, they but this, but, but we gotta make another record that sounds just like the first one. And we're like, that was like instant stress for me. I'm like, how is that gonna happen? We got, we can't. It's impossible. This is a whole new thing. It's, we can't do that. And they were pretty disappointed with the way our first few, or at least split personality and separation anxieties turned out and sound compared to their first EP, because it's just, it was early digital technology, I guess. Well, that's Nobody something that, that I, I wanted to talk to you about, because that's an interesting nexus. And I've spoken to Todd about what was going on sonically in that session. And this is just because as a student of production and as a producer myself, I'm always interested in what people are intending and what they're trying to make happen. And I know that in, it's sort of parallel to other periods in Todd's career of production, but this, but definitely he's interested in the, the line six uh, mm -hmm. um, amp modeling, correct? Yeah. And it's early, right? It's the beginning of amp modeling. It's, it's like the first, yeah, first wave okay. of those. Okay. Access so, to so Greg, Greg Hawks, who you know from the cars, he's played with Todd and when we've all played together in different situations, Greg and I toured with uh, Jesse Gress from Todd's band uh, doing Martha and the Motels and doing Patty Smyth, wow. Smith, Smythe. And, uh, you know, so, so Greg said that uh, the, the, the um, patch on the P Prophet Five at the beginning of Healing of Healer, yeah, yeah. is is the uh, is the first patch in the box. So and and, you know, and it's contemporaneous with that. So I mean, just like yeah. stuff like that's interesting. Uh, I think uh, so. So to kind of just talk about separation anxieties as a as a um, a fan of the material uh, and a little bit about the production. I, you know, I noticed some odd things about it. There's like, there's drum programming, obviously, on some stuff. There's some drum that's st really well produced, that's live sounding. Um, there seems to be looping involved. I'm not sure. But um, 
and I've talked to Todd about the record because I, you know, I play with Todd and also, you know, I'm a fan of his work. And, and so I, I know that, that on some level you guys weren't happy with things and I get all that, but just as a, a you know, outside party, I found it an interesting record because it's largely to me successful in terms of amp modeling. And I know it's not a, it's not the 12 rod sound that's going to become the, t the right sound in lost time. But I do. Well, think honestly, all the amp modeling, we've always used amp modeling. Every record we've ever had has been amp modeling. Okay. We've so never used a real amp ever. Okay. <laughs> so that's, 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 th that's nice to know. So, so yeah. what was your side of the, um, the line six situation there? Honestly? Yeah. Because I, I, I introduced Todd to line six. We brought our fluor amps and he's like, what, what the hell are these? I'm like, oh, this is line six. Check them out. And he's like, oh, okay. Next thing I know, he's called line six up and they're sending him spider amps for free like a week later. I'm like, how did you do that, Todd? He looks like I'm Todd Rundgren. I'm like, okay, so you just got endorsed by line six within a week's time after me introducing you to him. That's awesome. Where's my free amp? <laughs> you know, seriously. I mean, he hasn't, I don't know if you saw it, but he even admitted to that. And he, I didn't ever think he would. There was an interview. I saw someone linked to me too and he's like, Oh, and I asking him about line six. He's like, who introduced you to? He's like, oh, there's this band I work with called 12 Rods, and they they introduced me to him. He said it. I'm like, oh there's, my God, he admitted to it. Ryan, he would never hide that. You know, in he fact, did. so so the thing that that also I found interesting was that he said that you guys were super prepared. And and as a oh. compliment, and I, and I knew what he meant as a producer when he said. They came in very prepared. And I'll tell you what else he said. And I did very little. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's that's an interesting perspective on it. It's like you guys had it. He didn't have to. And, he, you know, I have to respect a guy that doesn't overproduce. But tell me in what way d does that translate into something that you guys have you mellowed on that that album or like because the writing is badass. I don't care what people say yeah, about the I mean, lyrics honestly, or whatever the fuck. I think it's a badass record. Separation think, Anxieties, yeah. 2000. You guys are in a really hip place, I think, musically. A lot of diversity on the record. I like the electronica on the record, to be honest. So I don't know. Do you, where do you stand on it now, Ryan? I mean, I, I, like, I love the material. I thought that outpouring that I uh, made for that record was a nice uh, a run of, you know, uh, creativity I went through. I think I, I, for that record, I think I made over over 20 songs um, for that record. And I, I, some of the, I, I, I have no regrets over the material I made. And even the label was like, when they heard the demo, they're like, yep. They're like, Ryan, time to write your singles because, you know, this is three records in now, like time to make a hit. And I'm like, mm, okay. And I give them so, these songs and they're like, so why you deliver. not? Why they tell not? Me that. I'm like, not okay, thank you. Do something. But they didn't. So. Uh, I mean, I'm happy with the material, the way Todd presented it. I could have, I, my mind and only in my mind, and I've let it go too, that I could have been taken up a level. I would have liked to have seen it gone even up a level on some level, not just him adding a, you know, a, a fake marionette voice on the marionette itself or, you know, not that, but that's to me, the only thing I can hear that he changed in the record that we haven't raw put on tape you know <laughs> everything else sounds pretty just raw to me i mean it could have been way more refined i thought in various ways if he if he thought and as a producer and i respect his opinion if he really thought that that was where it needed to be you know i'm, I'm not going to knock that oh so you guys were were reined in oh yeah yeah we we were in hawaii for like six weeks but but the music was toned down oh. in some way well not toned down just not elaborated upon or not to me it wasn't really given whatever that todd touch that i maybe was hoping to get in some magical way that i wasn't well, expecting tell, please, or... tell me your tell me your experience with todd's music be, so before you get to that moment my experience with his music <laughs> well, i mean i was introduced to todd with my brother of course and believe it or not the first todd record i heard which is a strange one was uh, the acapella record but then i got you know, of course, before before I you know I, I'm dealing with Todd. You know, by now I have like you know Wizard of True Star, which I love. Um, um, you know that era of stuff, and 
a lot of respect for Todd and his abilities. And he's an amazing singer, amazing player. It's really, I mean, all over the map. My brother gave, my brother was, thought Todd was the shit at the time, you know, and still does, of course. And I respect that. And everyone's like, Todd, you know, I've always, because my brother was so into Todd, of course, I was letting my brother have Todd, you know, growing up. But I, he was always a household name. And, you know, once I privied myself to Todd, you know, I was like, yeah, it's great stuff. I know I only had that apprehension to get into it as much as I might have had to because of my brother. My brother was already into it. You can't do too much like your older brother when you're did you in the punk see, rock. Did you see Utopia in, in Ohio? No, I didn't. I, no, I just remember Utopia showing up and we had this store called Odd Lots, which is big lots. You know, and every time I went in there as a kid, all I'd see is Utopia records. I had no idea like who this band was. I see Todd on there. This even before I knew Todd, but I just I just remember going into this store and in this clearance bin for years would just be nothing but Utopia records. And I'm like, weird. So that's that's <laughs> that's really so funny. Of course, I was like, oh well, this band comedy can't be any good if they're just stuck in rod lots. No one's buying their records. I'm like, that was an awful thing to think. But you know, that's probably where all my records are at this point. So. If well, it's, fu it's funny, but that way, but, but you guys were into the, his vocal arranging. Clearly you guys were into oh, his Oh my stuff. God. I mean, this, this is harmonic ability and it's just this level of talent was obviously, um, you know, preternaturally great. You know, it was, you just had something that was cool and granted, not all the stuff was my style. Some of the stuff to me was a little quirky. Like what? I, I didn't really care for a lot of his videos, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, there was a song. Um, it was on early MTV. It was probably like yeah. the seventh video MTV ever. Or, uh, Time video heals. At, Time heals. I, not not my favorite song. I did. I, I couldn't leave that session without him seeing like running away from a cross or something like that. And that I, there was no hook. I couldn't remember any of the part of the song after that. You know, I just remember him running away from this superimposed cross or something like that. But I like Time Heals. I'm, it's not a bad song. It's just when it comes to like. It's not the way I I I, I, I write. I, I it is. I'm not saying it's a bad song at all. It's just it didn't stick with me the first time I heard it. I remember seeing it and going, and, and I, I could never remember how the song went after that. I was I'll too. Put that up by, against like, any. I'll put that up against any Hall and Oates tune. <laughs> I love Hall and Oates. Um, I, I knew know it, you do. So obviously that's the ballpark, right? Yeah, I, I guess um, that song in particular. There was. I don't know. I guess I'd have to listen to it again. I just, I have at this point, a lot of unfortunate pre or, or, or not preconceived, but just post-conceived post-conceived <laughs> ideas about exactly about that may or may not be right at all. You know, all right, just, well, let, me, let me ask you this then. So what is Todd's production role in getting you to this house to record this stuff? It was pretty funny, actually. Um, in a nutshell, uh, he calls me up. And we're talking, you know, briefly, whatever. We end up going to Hawaii, and Virgin we get brought there, you together. Virgin brought you together. Yep. Uh, what's that? I'm sorry. Virgin brought you together. Yes. Yeah. Ver, uh, our yeah, and our. Well, I made a I made a list of like dream producers. Who were they? And um, well, Todd was up there. Um, I forget. I for, honestly forget what the others even were because oh, I'm sure it was like uh, 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 uh. uh I'm sure Butch Big was on there, of course. You know, I'm sure like you know all the other '90s big guys were on there. You know, but someone else. There's 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 a few people that I I wished. And did you know I English Settlement? Uh, did you know um, Skylarking by XTC? Yeah. Did yeah. Did you know Todd's production on that record? Oh yeah, and it's actually. I to be honest, I mean, God, I I, I don't even know if I want to say this, but my favorite XTC records were not Todd's records. I liked a uh, a uh, 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 what was Fox? What was the first name of the guy? The other producer that XTC worked with? Paul um, Fox. Fox. Paul Fox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought oh, his record yeah. was a little cooler. I don't know. I always kind of gravitated to those a little bit more. Um, I don't mind Skylarking at all, but just, there's something about the sound of the others that were just better. And I don't know. It could be. It could be also me be being a little, you know, uh, just judgmental at this point about it all. But well, I'm curious because the 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 um. The production style of XTC is, seemed to me to be something that would be of interest to Twelve Rods. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. you know, oh, just right. some of some of the way the drums were going to be produced and some of the way the the sounds were going to be pretty aggressive. Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, um, they're post punk punk in that way too. You know, you like absolutely. things like even Scarecrow people, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, just some of their like their harder stuff was was pretty punk in a sophisticated way. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, they were they were rambunctious. You know, I mean, it's live especially. They were just kind of, I mean, for a while there, I mean, it seemed like I, what I saw live, they were kind of a fun proggy punk band. You know, they the way they, 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 they had that vibe. Did you um, see them? I never had, but I've just seen videos and stuff like yeah. that, whatever exists. Yeah, they were um, unhinged, but but I get yeah. that that energy of of um, of of um, angst and uh, you know a kind of uh, hyper focus. <laughs> I think is is really a, a, one of the great byproducts of that whole musical uh, era. I, I agree. There is a, there is an urgency. Uh, and, and, yeah, and I, 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 yeah. I lo like I said, I, I think that was one of the first and probably the most obvious uh, uh, comparison, I guess, 12 Rods had that was floating around was the XTC one. Um, and so I, you know, since day one, everyone's making references and this and that, which makes me almost want to like stand back a little bit from it all. And sometimes like, I don't want to learn or not learn, but be too close to this. Otherwise, I really am going to start sounding like XTC. And, no, but you know, it's like, common interests. And, and yeah, and it's just continue like, to be that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Because, I mean, it was also that the era of the tribal drumming thing that filtered in through that, through BFAR, through all, I, I'm just drawing all these connections because, you know, that's what, what it is. Then you want some of that in your music, mm -hmm. you know, then you're going to want yeah. that. But so how do you end up with Drum Machine Dry on a uh, rock and roll band? Uh, I, I'm electronic. I mean, I, I, I'm surrounded by this, well, I'm in this era of massive technological advancement right now. I mean, obviously things have exponentially curved in massive ways. We can literally do anything we want with music now. I can't not submerge myself in that culture. I mean, this is a very rare time to be alive where sampling technology is at its apex point to the point where we can literally and have no, uh, there's no excuse not to get exactly what we want out of our heads anymore, none, you know? So I gotta hone this era you know there's a lot of not only with that but also with what what comes with that is a lot of lost easily lost technologies that surround these years that are incredibly affordable and usable and once you use them it's a definitive sound it takes you it, it makes things still feel a little more real rather than just being on a computer all the time so i mean now instead of having brass instruments and reed instruments all around the house we have electronic instruments. The modern musician is just, it's just, it's a different game. It's a different era. And I'm luckily lucky to be born. And I feel very lucky to be born right when analog music and digital music happen, occur, fold over, you know, go full circle. I mean, my, my dad himself, my dad has been studying a music and teaching music that's 400 years old. It's about time for like something completely new now, you know, the rock and roll quote brought us on 80s brought on electronic music. And it's just like, yes, I mean, this is where things are. I can't not be involved with this. I'm going to be like a forward thinking musician at any level. So it's like, yeah, I, by default, you have to become an electronic musician. Um, I mean, it's, you just have to. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just too much. There's too many things you have to learn how to use anymore in order to like make a record or, or perform on a record. I mean, it's all about that. I mean, and, and it's not just like learning one thing. You have to learn hundreds of things anymore. And um, that's what I take on. You know, I'm trying to embrace that with as much classical knowledge as I can retain still and, and, uh, and a forward thinking sort of like, you know, a, a mentality with how I write or, or what my concepts are. I mean, I just have to embrace that crappy drum machines are awesome. <laughs> And then they yeah. really are. You know, a program and, and being a drummer and knowing how. I mean, I I, I had to pro learn how to program drum machines in the rods so I could program. I wasn't programming like house beats. I was trying to emulate exactly how I would play it with dynamics, and then you know replicate to to a T every note of how it could be played to put the best of a drum, DR 660s possibility. That turned into like advanced programming, which turned into more creative things down the road. But it was essentially made for the, or my drum program was, was for an educational purpose, for my band. I had to make a mock version of a part, program it, show someone else who's going to play it live. And they learn it from that. If you are really good at programming, that's where it all comes from. It was for 
live, but now it's just hyper, you know, reached itself into like futurism and like, you know, postmodernisms and, and, uh, wow. and, and all sorts of underground cultural, you know, electronic movements that I'm now immersed in. Um, it's, it's just something that's just, it's just a very, uh, what's well, of the times, it's sign of the times. It's all it is. I mean, I can't deny. And I can, I'm not going to be a guitarist for the rest of my life. I was a guitarist for a brief period of my life because that was the tool that it took, you know. Um, and I never, you know, and same with the voice and being a front man. You know, I just I, I applied myself to the scenario. And that's kind of what I'm doing now, not on stage. But, I, you know, it's just, that's the definition of being a modern musician. You just have to be a kind of a jack of all freaking trades. Um, and I, I, if you want to get a record done and you don't have any money, learn how to make a record from the ground up and learn how to finish it, you know, learn how to master, learn how to build your own instruments and learn how to master your record all the way through by yourself. It just to me seems like what we have to do anymore. Um, and that's a lot to do. Uh, so with that goes, it's programming, There's tons of programming involved you have to do, which I accept, it's fun. I have, a, I have a geeky mind too. And that's kind of split right down the middle of like, you know, uh, you know what I'm saying, but I just, I, it's just embracing the times. It's as simple as that. And I think that you guys did a lot of really good tone coloring in your production, particularly when I look at how, uh, like say fake Ma magic eight ball, when you go to the bridge, the production style changes completely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we did that a few times on that record. It was, it's, it's freaking fun. You know, it's great. It's great to be, able, but not do it in such a, a, a disjunct way. You know, it's hopefully, you know, the chords will lead you there. Also, in a, a different feel, but, you know, having a bridge or another part of the song that goes there isn't unheard of, but it was something I wanted to do as, as, as far fetched as that even was. It was like, oh my God, look what we just did. We just kind of busted down to a bossa nova right there or something. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's yeah, like, and there's Boston elements in Radio Action. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, we always had a, a you know, soul, jazz sort of thing to us that we always kind of, my brother and I came from, especially, um, that, you know, we started delving in lightly into those territories of, you know, uh, beat making and more dance, not dance, but drum machine music, something that's not quite so tribal. Um, but we, it was just an attempt to evolution of what we did, which of course, the more we did that stuff, the more the band became splintered <laughs> because, you know, it just became more electronic, you know, and then, then who's needed? No, we'll be needed. So it's, with so that it comes right. Eventually just, wasn't going to be a live unit. It just was going that way because, um, well, for various reasons, the sign of the times, you know, just what was, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, there just became a time in 12 Rods where most most members just decided to quit. <laughs> well, so, you also had a great drummer in that band named Dave King. Yeah. So, you know, you're familiar with Dave King. I am. Yeah. yeah. He's a he's quite a character, too. Um, yes, he is. Oh, I'd love to have him on the program. He's hilarious. Yeah. He's he's uh, incredibly hilarious. Um, he's a mice. <laughs> kind of dangerous. But I, I love him for that. You know, just like Christopher. They're just they have their own own personalities very unique and i love those See, but, types but of people. that's like he was your drumbo it's like you guys always had your drummer that was going to have a personality because yeah. you cared about that because all the instruments count yep no i did there had to be a, a certain core to every i mean just to go with the territory if you're, if you're going to be hyper involved like that and that instrument that's weird is it's lost time is lost, weird. is lost time album is that all dave king uh yeah yep Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's, the, the drum performances are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I know he's, no, he's great. It was, it's great. It's, it's amazing. His, his, uh, yeah, there's a few it's things sound. I got to admit that I've done to him on that record that I don't want to, I mean, it's kind of funny and I don't even think he would mind that I told you this, but there's like, okay, you know, in telephone holiday. Yeah. Where everything's had that in the chorus. Dave can't do that. He can't play a straight beat. He can't do that for more than a measure until he breaks down. He can't have both it's a of his variation feet or breaks no. off. He can't it's have both of his feet do the same thing at the same time, like boom, 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 boom. Because I had yeah, the kid yeah. four and a four and a kick. Yeah. He can't. 
you can't do you can't play the same thing over and over for, for more than one measure and so i had to like i had to cut and paste that entire part because he could not play the straightest disco beat he can do everything else in the world but he can't play a disco beat that fast and it was pretty funny and he even kind of found that kind of funny too like, i'm sure <laughs> it was too basic no i totally get that there's definitely things that you're just like I would drift off so fast into other yeah. stuff if I had to keep that going. Broadway shows, I was terrible at vamps. Yeah. <laughs> I, I played in the pit. You want me to what? I can't vamp. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, yeah, I, the third I'm time not... it comes around, you got to do something different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, exactly. And it, it's, that was the struggle. I mean, Dave is by, you know, he's a bop drummer at heart. So it's... Uh, but he he had an affinity to want to play with the rod really bad. He kind of forced himself into the group, and we loved it. It was great. But he, uh, how'd you get that drum sound on that record? Uh, various. I don't know if you've seen pictures of that session, but it's it's just a piece. I mean, it, it it's a piece together. If you saw, I could probably send you some. There might be even some be some online. But how there's, is it pieced? It's just like my drum set, where it's just like I I have like a you know, twenty inch kick drum there. There's a floor tom that's on the ground without any legs on it. There's like uh, a snare with a, with a big cloth over it. There's like one cymbal, but it's like not even on a stand right. And it's just like, everything is wrong. <laughs> it looks like you look at this picture, like this is professional. It doesn't even look, this kit doesn't even look set up, you know? And we make these certain, you know, to, Dave likes it too. That's what's cool about Dave is that he, as much of a consummate professional he is, he loves the odd shit. He loves like yeah, why not? Throwing drum set down there and just beating on it, you know. And we just half our sounds were just kind of like thought on that approach level of just let's have a lot of fun here, and this is kind of like we're we're, we're gonna nail this however we do it. It's just you know, let's you know let's take us to those depths to kind of screw with people and ourselves, you know. Let's not set up anything conventionally sort of issues, which are tons of fun. And, and he. It, it, it just adds a spark to everything, you know? It adds just a little more aggression or energy or something when you're playing like a kit that's just... Fucked up. <laughs> it's fucked up. And it's just, you know how it is. And it's, yeah, just, kind of, kind of it's interesting, right? You have to really think a little bit about what you're doing because it's not intuitive of your normal setup. No, no. And that, yeah. And then you start hitting other things and it, just, it, it brings, especially if it's stuff you practice, you start hitting things differently. And after a few takes, it's just like, there's a whole new level of inspiration that kind of goes along with that. Dave rarely used his own kits. He always wanted to take my old kits and just put them together weird. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I was like, that, that, that's the kind of drummer I like working with. You know, I just, he'll just grab whatever and throw it there. And just, blah, blah, you know, and I just, I don't know. I like that sort of aesthetic in general. Well, a whole thing that, that I was into in solo percussion was prepared drum kit. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's so you're familiar with. Yeah, Dave does a lot of bowings himself, and he has plates and certain things he puts all over his snares, and yeah. you know, it's prepared stuff essentially. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's a big thing in Minneapolis. There's a lot of drummers in, in Minneapolis that uh, JT Bates and uh, Joey Van Phillips, and who are all like, incredible jazz drummers that are really, you know, go into those territories of you know slathering the drum sets with extra stuff all over it, just draping anything they want and hitting it in weird ways. You know, it's. Everybody's Everything. strong scene like that around here. It's cool. You know, it's also post electronic. It is. It, a lot of those guys, that's another cool, cool thing about Minneapolis is that there's a huge, great tie over between, uh, say, IDM music, like, you know, early electronic music in the 90s and the jazz scene. And there's a few key, like, players, really great jazz guys in town here who are also DJs that are also like, I don't know if I've ever heard, like, Adam Lins or um, um, it, it, uh, there's a few other guys, but you know, ridiculous players, you know, really just top notch. And they have the most incredible, like, you know, records collection and they're DJing in this uh, a dance night. And it's like, you know, there's that respect. So it's since like the mid nineties, jazz drummers around this town, all, every one of them had their own like drum and bass group, you know, or their own like, you know, break chorus sort of ensemble. Um, Cause it was, I don't know, it was a hip thing. All the jazz drummers got it. All the all the jazz drummers in this town, at least, love and embrace drum machines. Wow. You know, there's not one single guy around that doesn't think like, you know, a crappy drum machine isn't cool. You know, it's just, it's wild. And it's kind of An instrument to them. Yeah, it is. I mean, that they're very adventurous around here. And, and through the, the guidance of people like, you know, Dave King and JT Bates in this town, you know, they're, 
highly revered and very influential. There's a whole score of drummers around here that are that play just like them now. You know, you know, you know Dave King style. He very step on he digs like this a lot. And, you know, it's like the Minneapolis style anymore. It's crazy. Um, but <laughs> it's interesting because drummers now that that are playing that way also. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy. He he came out of William Patterson, uh, where I okay. teach. Uh, Mark, who's the drummer? Mark. Oh wow, can't think of his last name. They're able to to create parts in an improvisational sense on the kit that are totally compositional. Yeah, linear. Yeah. Linear, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's we have. Yeah, a very advanced drum community, I think, in this town, but it also lends itself to a lot of drummers that can't also play pop very well. <laughs> if you understand, I mean, as much as the, that drumming is great, you try to take these great drummers and put them in, a, except for a couple of them who can really focus, but it's really hard to kind of get a consistency sometimes out of some of these drummers. They just, you know, can't lay back on a groove for, you know, two measures without <laughs> some sort of polyrhythm in the snare drum. And, you know, but and that was always my kind of thing with you know Dave and I would spat a little bit about like, like Dave that was just a, too big of a fill yeah. <laughs> sometimes you know just a little too big as much as I thought it was cool it's just like whoa I just that bled over into the next phrase a little too long Dave you know it's stuff like that you know but I love how the drums bust out in when the verse comes back in 24 hours uh, and the drums start the, the the verse out coming out of the the talk uh it's been 21. Which song again was this? 24 hours. And this is uh, going. The way the drums. Coming out of the bridge? Yeah, coming out of the bridge. God. That's just drums oh, and voice. Yeah, the way he, yeah. He's bashed no, he, he did, yeah, he did a great job. That's, 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 he did a great job with that one. Um, yeah, so to me, he, those, that's a really good rock band sound. The drums are really alive. They're really clearly defined in the mix. Yeah, that was, thank you. Thank you. I mean, actually for, for early digital, I thought we did about, we spent a lot of time, my brother and I like mixing and mastering that. And it was tough. You know, we didn't always have the greatest, we still had to rely on outboard equipment still because we knew and we still didn't quite have the good digital stuff yet. You know, UAD didn't exist. They were dealing with like, you know, 16 bit waves sort of like, you know, technology. And it so just, that's it was all laughing. digital? Everything's digital? Everything, digital console, digital everything. And it was, um, Drums a feat, because we knew what we were up against. We, we knew that we had to like try to try to create a warmer, more in-depth sound that had to somehow, as much as we can, analog or uh, emulate that feel. Because we were just old enough to still know that that's a better sound. But we had this very optimistic view of like digital technology that we were ready to embrace prematurely. That uh, you know, uh, luckily it's, it's, caught, it's caught up and fucking it sounds amazing these days but back then it was a struggle to get like a good warm drum sound or, or, or get some overdrive or get some sort of you know anomalous sort of anomaly that occurs through analog uh, tubes or whatever a lot of that we were able to you know, simulate but and but it was, it was it was it was more work than it probably had to be but it was a learning process of how to like in our world you know reflect upon a time when even in our life music sounded like this all of a sudden we're flipped in this whole new technology where people are admittedly going this doesn't sound nearly as good as what it used to be but at the same time it has this incredible bright future so we're stuck going okay do we which way do we fall on the fence it's like you know no one else is doing this so we got to fall on this side of the fence as much as it's not it might not even be cool you know there's, there's a faith that was a you know Kind of a rocket scientist behind the computer anyway so it's like we could make this work he went to music school he went to peabody conservatory of music as an audio engineer so he knew everything he had to do i was learning from him um so it was we just embraced it knowing that we we're the only ones kind of doing this and ballsy enough to like say we're a rock band and we're not touching analog stuff almost purposefully just because it's i don't know it, it's it's too cool it's like we all know that you know it's what's ahead of us you know we're not gonna use the oh we gotta use analog tube amps all the time as a crutch to say we're cool you know well, we're, gonna make you this. And we're gonna make it off the, the less fortunate technology and say something about it and make a point with it you know 
But let me ask you this. Are. But with the AMP modeling, so what are your choices at that point that, that you get such a raw electric sound on that record? Hey, you just got to turn. I mean, you can't just rely on the presets all the time. But really, it's, it's an amplifier. An amplifier, it, it emits sound, it emits a distorted sound, and there's so much, such a, bra a broad range of tolerance of what a guitar can sound like at this point. If you just play it with some sort of finesse, musicality, it really doesn't matter what your sound is. I mean, it does, but people are going to accept anything. I mean, we listen to tons of old records that have this most beautiful X part. If you listen to it, that's a horrible sound that can be way brewed upon. That also lends itself to the charm factor then. And you got to kind of balance out like um, uh, just the psychology of like what can be done, what people are going to hear objectively, how they're going to interpret it. And we just figured, you know, if it plays like a guitar, why can't it be used? You know, there are way crappier tube amps out there that people are going to say are better, but sound worse than this. Um, what I'm able to do. So it's like, it was just getting over that stigma of digital. You know, it's, it's not like it never sounded like a guitar, it never sounded like anything but a guitar. It was just like, people had to say something. People had to compare it. People were scared to death of digital technology. And they mean, like, oh my God, it's going to render my tube amp useless. And I spent $5,000 on this thing. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe you should accept the value that these have a, might have a long way to go, or maybe they're not, it doesn't sound exactly like your tube amp. But my God, it's an amplifier. It still works. It's loud, and he plays. You play a chord, and it sounds like a distortion. What more do you really need? I mean, really, I'll I'm not. I'll that tell much you. Of right around the same time, we were dealing with an amp modeling situation, which I think you'll find interesting. I was helping out on a production of uh, archival recording of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, wow. 1972, in Ohio, in a school auditor, uh, school gymnasium on a double bill with Jack, uh, with uh, Wes Bruce and Lang. Uh, I think it's Cleveland 72. And okay. so it's, um, it's, everybody is, it's four track. Yeah. I think it's bass, guitar, drums are submixed, uh, keyboard. No, it's, it's eight mics, but one of the, the mics that they use is a, uh, a channel for just the talk mic, but they leave the talk mic on and it goes to, to tape. Mm -hmm. the violin, however, they're just taking from the pickup. Mm -hmm. So we're listening to the screeching of this recording, you know, at, at Sony Studios. And Bob Belden is, is producing and he's looking to put this out. Uh, so it's early amp modeling at this after the tape has been transferred from from the analog. And we find out a picture of where of what amp J Jerry Goodman was using on stage in 1972. And we find that in the amp modeling oh. and we take the pickup signal, put it through the amp modeling. Don't use the pickup sound. Yep. Now it's coming through the sun bass rig that he was playing through with Ma Vishnu really loud. And it's an improved sound. I mean, it might not be like a tube sound or whatever, but it worked probably better than me. Yeah. So that was the philosophy I kind of rooted myself in. It didn't have to be like the best sound, whatever that ideal sound someone's going for. I just, if it replicates the notes that you're playing, that's really enough. And the rest is just touch and how you dial things in subtly. And, you know, no one ever knew and no one ever cared. All, when it got past the, uh, the conversational points of like digital or analog, no one ever questioned us after a show other than saying, wow, those amps sounded cool. What are they? And we'd be happy to say, guess what? They're digital, you know? And they'd be like, really? You know, so, so separation, it. is separation anxieties fully digital? Everything is digitized? Yep, yep. Even probably more so than the others. And so what is Todd's contribution to the overall sound then? I don't know. <laughs> so other, than, other than affecting the marionette voice at the very beginning, um, when he kind of makes it sound like a wind-up doll or a pull, pull cord doll. It has that <laughs> Otherwise, that's your mix? Well, he, it's his mix. He just he didn't he didn't fix anything. It was pretty much just raw. <laughs> I mean, it might have been a vocal fix here or there, but it just pretty much sound like raw. I mean, I, there was a few overdubs here and there, but I don't think there was. I mean, it's it's pretty raw. How would you have well, refined it though? I think it's it's. I don't know. I mean, I guess it is. I think. I mean, performance wise, it's probably okay. I think. 
my comp, I didn't like the way that dr- he made the drum sound. And it was just the drums had a little trash can. It was too trash canny or something like that. I haven't listened to that record in such a long time. I, I, I can't forget how it sounds. I've been too just kind of like sure, sure. in my head that it sounds bad more so that I've actually re- listened to it recently. And go, hey, you know, maybe that isn't that bad. Yeah. But I remember when I got it back, listening to it with, you know, my roommates going, ugh. You know, and we're all looking at each other going, this doesn't sound very good. And like Unvinyl. getting all depressed. And my friends are going, man, Ryan, sorry. <laughs> Seriously, it was just like that. It was one of those things like we weren't happy with this the way overall sound. I mean, it was just in the mix or the mastering. I can't say what. It's just nothing. And we didn't even, I guess we didn't really know what we wanted. We wanted we wanted a record that sounded like a Chad Blake or Mitchell Froome record, probably. And there's no way we're getting that. <laughs> but, you know, it's, we want... We wanted warmth. We wanted something a little bigger. You know, we were hearing records at that point that were like, already people are making records sound great again on CD. Yeah, you, know, you listen to an American Music Club record, or you listen to like a Chivo Mono record, and you're like, these things sound amazing, beautifully warm, gorgeous records. Oh my God, and it's on a CD. Wow. Okay, so digital technology is possible. So you know, based off that alone, I knew digital technology had a way because if I could hear a CD. That sounds incredibly in depth. And this is a 16 bit 441 CD file, nothing big. If it can portray everything I want to hear out of an analog instrument, that, you know, digital technology is worthy. You know, that, that's my proof that I believe that digital technology has a future. It's already replicating great sounding music. Whether or not we can make those out of, you know, there with, you know, just the conversions there at least between analog and digital to make it happen. Um, but uh, oh, another point to this, I forgot where this conversation was going. <laughs> Sorry. Well, let me ask you this: What, where can people find what you're up to these days? Um, Bandcamp, you know the <laughs> the standard, you know, channels. You, you, you know, if you want to go to Spotify, do all that junk. You know, it's on iTunes. Yeah, and this I only say that out of, out of some sort of depression because yeah, it's like people stream that stuff all the time, don't see much money off it, but you know, it's just one of those things where people kind of like just go get to. And the twelve rod stuff is also on uh, Spotify, which I I've been uh, checking out there. It sounds yeah, good. I think on it, there. Thank you. Um, but I guess all the pitch stuff, uh, pitch record stuff, is the stuff that um, you can find on Bandcamp, of course, and Spotify, and this and that. All those records are up on there, and it's we have. Yeah, just check out that stuff. It's it's it's. <laughs> I'd be interested to hear or, or to, to hear what you think about it and compare it to uh, the rods. A lot of people are like, "Yeah, I can hear your songwriting through and through on that." Granted, it's a completely different sound. You know, luckily well, something. You know, comes it's so great that you change your sonic worlds, man. You know, I was talking to Andy Partridge about this very thing. It's like, you know, do you don't want the same meal every meal of the day and every day of the week? And yeah. you know, you got, you want some variety in your life. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to expand on a concept all the time. I'm trying to yeah. better myself. I'm trying to do and finally create the sound, get to the point where I can create everything I hear exactly in my head, which is still an ongoing you know, struggle and always will be. It's just, you know, I, I just have a problem with those musicians who I grew up loving, adoring, idolizing in, in some sort of way. And then I, I, I'm, you know, acquainted with them online and, all I hear from them is and see from them is pictures of them from their glory days over and over. And that's all they post about is them and their prime. And, and it's just like, really, you haven't done anything since. Yeah. I mean, really? I mean, yeah, I, I see that so moving. frequently. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really depressing. And it's like the last thing I want to be in life. I mean, since I was a kid, like, I don't want to be this. I mean, I, I identified it when I was young. If I'm ever going to be a rock guy, I'm not going to be the, I don't want to be the washed up rock guy, even though I probably am. I don't want to be the dude that that's forever looking back on his glory days. You know, I never wanted to be able to begin with. And I have way too many ideas that, you know, I've already reinvented myself three times now oh, since 12 rounds musically. No, I know and what it's I'm like. I'm not it's doing like... that for the sake of reinvention. I'm just doing it because I just have no choice. And people... I don't understand how people can't do that. You know, people definitely pigeonhole you. I've been through it myself. Definitely yeah. people know you from one record and then they think that's your whole thing. So, and, you know, that's fine just, too. I'm happy that even like the 12 rod stuff is, you know, has that longevity and like, you know, someone today will just discover 12 rods. I mean, I just, two days ago, two days ago, there was this kid out of nowhere, 18 year old, you know, non-binary kid out of nowhere, just 
asking me all these 12 rods questions. I'm like, you, you're born in 2003. You're hardly even alive when we ended, you know, and he's absolutely ecstatic about, you know, 12 rods. I'm like, man, I mean, that is like the best thing for me. It, your, that your, is music the best still, thing. It, your music still resonates. People should still listen to it. Obviously, if the band is inactive, that music stands up, man. And it's, it's such a great body of work. And then they should go beyond that and check out all your other stuff because yeah. the evolving artist is so important in, in our world. And, you know, it's not about a project. The project is all of the different musical worlds that you want to explore, mm -hmm. I think. And, and so yeah, you've always been right. very interesting to me for that reason, man. And I appreciate you taking the time to chat That's about your stuff. This has yeah, been really you. great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for having me on the show. I look forward to seeing how this turns out and watching more of your, your, your program. So thank you very much. Right on, man. Yeah, man. Thank you cool. so much. All right, Thanks bud. for listening, everyone. Check out 12 Rods, Ryan Alcott.